Carrier labels are printed after rating a shipment and selecting a carrier. Carrier labels provide a human readable representation of the important shipment details so the carrier can then deliver that product accurately. The label includes ship from, ship to address information, uh, the tracking details, and there's also a user, there's user defined real estate on the label for values that the receiving party may require that the shipping party actually print uh, to, to assist them with their receiving process into their facilities. The, the carrier label also includes uh, the carrier's proprietary barcode, which is, is embedded with symbology that is decoded by their scanners as the product is picked up, routed to their facility centers on their conveyor belts, and, and as the product is delivered to the end customer. Having the ability to track the status of a shipment throughout the shipment life cycle is absolutely critical for a shipper. Carriers offer package tracking services for shippers and ultimately for the receiving party. When packages are rated, the tracking number is returned back to the shipper and it's printed on the label. The shipper typically will store that tracking number in their ERP system or order management system to effectively arm their customer service reps with uh, the tracking details. So if there are any inquiries from a customer germane to shipping, they're armed with uh, the, the actual real-time status of where that shipment's at. The tracking number is often sent back to customers on an email as well uh, with some sort of a notation that uh, your shipment has been processed and they'll arm their customers for more for self-support to be able to track their own shipment. Uh, the tracking can be performed from a, from a portal, a web browser, or even now from a smartphone. We're now going to transition the discussion to motor carriers. LTL and TL carriers are often referred to as motor carriers. LTL car carriers usually ship larger loads that weigh more than the limitations that are imposed by the small parcel carriers. LTL, or less than truckload shipments, range from 100 pounds to about 15,000 pounds. They're typically used when uh, the small parcel weight threshold has been exceeded, and, and often it's for business to business shipments. Usually an LTL shipment is not, however, large enough to fill a trailer or a full trailer uh, to qualify for full truckload rates. Shipments larger than about 15,000 pounds are typically classified as truckload or TL shipments. If a shipper is shipping enough product to a single delivery destination to fill a full trailer, they will be offered a, tr a full truck rate which is considerably cheaper than uh, the LTL rates which is based on the 100 weight rate system. If shippers can consolidate shipments uh, to, to one larger shipment so that they can all be delivered to let's say a, re a regional distribution center and then perform the final mile delivery using a different carrier they can often reduce their overall transportation spend by filling up a full trailer. This is uh, commonly referred to as zone skipping. A bill of lading document is required for all motor carrier shipments. The BOL is a document that defines uh, the content of the shipment broken down by freight class. And the BOL serves as a document of title, uh, a contract of carriage, and also it's used for a receipt of goods by the receiving party. Uh, the carrier can only deliver product to the receiving party to find on the BOL. Like parcel carriers, motor carriers offer a wide assortment of accessorial services to their shippers. Accessorial services are additional fees that are added to the base rate and include services such as delivering to a residential address, delivering within an urban zone, providing a lift gate for load and or unload, and, and many, many others. So how do the rates work for motor carriers? LTL carriers typically charge by freight class, and, uh, and they quote based on per 100 pounds, or what's commonly, commonly referred to as per 100 weight, or CWT. Uh, the National Motor Freight Traffic Association, or NMFTA, issues a publication called the NMFC or the National Motor Freight Classification. Within that is a, a listing of codes um, for every different type of item that ships via truck. So shippers will assign their NMFC codes uh, and, and the, the codes are based on the density of the product, loadability, mixability, value, and other factors. But the, the freight class is really based on the density of the shipment. And the freight classes range from 50 to 500 and generally indicate the percentage of the base rate that should apply. Please note that LTL carriers always have a minimum or typically always have a minimum charge for any shipment. 
Um, so let's get back to freight classes for a moment. The more dense items are, such as steel, machinery, uh, the lower the classification will be. Uh, again, they start at 50. Fragile or bulky items will fall into a higher freight class from 125 up to, to 500 and pay a higher shipment cost per pound or per hundred weight. Uh, so let's, let's consider an extreme example here uh, of shipping pallets of bowling balls and pallets of bean bags. The bowling balls are obviously much more dense and thus qualify for a lower freight class. The bean bags, however, they're, they're, uh, they're going to consume a lot more space uh, and they offer less billable tonnage for the shipper. Therefore, the freight class is much higher and the shipper pays uh, more per hundred weight. Besides class, rates, and discounts, an LTL carrier will apply a wide range of surcharges and accessorial charges that affects the final price of the shipment. Most shipments will receive a fuel surcharge, just like parcel, uh, which is always a significant portion, uh, a proportion of the overall cost, possibly as much as 30% or even more. Some uncommon accessorial charges are uh, lift gate, uh, inside pickup, inside delivery, uh, white glove services, and there's many, many others. Also, charges for additional insur insurance are literally hundreds of other possibilities may be added to the final freight bill. Typically, shippers will negotiate their base rates with carriers. The discount percentage is then used to determine the actual final cost per hundred weight. Uh, and shippers will also negotiate for uh, FAK or what's uh, referred to as freight of all kinds. Freight of all kinds is sort of a catch-all for carrier tariff classification. Freight is charged per shipment, irrespective of the nature of the goods, uh, so not broken out into different NMFC classifications. Uh, this is usually used so you can simplify paperwork uh, and the, the packers don't have to know the specifics of each item a warehouse may ship. Uh, and typically shippers will negotiate for freight of all kinds rating uh, for all products shipped to uh, to simplify paperwork, billing, and also add new products to their to their product suite. All right, so we're now going to transition into a discussion about freight terms. Who is actually paying for the transportation cost? Who gets invoiced? As previously mentioned, transportation is not a product cost. It's a cost associated with selling and delivering products to customers. Transportation costs, they may be waived by the shipper or the receiving party may be billed directly for freight. Freight terms are usually not determined by the shipping personnel, but rather pre-negotiated for a business relationship and assigned to the customer's order before it ever gets passed down to the shipping department. Carriers support multiple methods of collecting and ultimately invoicing for transportation costs. The, the common methods include prepaid, collect, consignee, bill recipient, and bill third party. Depending on the payment method, the shipper may actually need information to pro properly create shipping documents and to notify the carriers of the method in use. Prepaid, prepaid effectively means the shipper will be invoiced for the freight cost. The rates in effect are the rates the shipper has negotiated with the carrier. Uh, a, a subset of prepaid is known as prepaid and add, and effectively this means that the shipper is uh, billed for the freight, but they'll add additional fees when they uh, invoice their customer. In this case, when you hear of companies that are seeking to turn their shipping department into a profit center, they're trying to co control their total cost of shipping so that the cash flow from shipping charges is lower than their actual cost. Collect means the carrier will invoice the recipient. Bill recipient also means that the recipient will be billed for the freight. Please note that this is not the same as COD or collect on delivery. COD is a value added service option where the carrier collects the actual cost of the goods and in many cases they may also uh, collect for the cost of transportation as well. Consignee billing is a special program that exists through UPS. Its use is rare but it is encountered in practice. The consignee will be billed for the freight costs at a contracted rate, and there are special requirements for using consignee bill that extend beyond the, uh, the prepaid collect requirements. And finally, third-party billing is used when neither the shipper nor the recipient will be invoiced for freight. The third party may have a relationship with either the shipper or the recipient. I'd also like to describe carrier accounts in detail. Carriers set up their customers, or in this case a shipper, with a carrier account. The carrier account is used for invoicing customers for freight. Shippers establish accounts for each unique carrier. 
and each unique physical location that they ship from or each unique point of origin. It's common for shippers to have multiple sites and thus they'll have multiple shipping accounts. Shippers may also establish unique carrier accounts for product that's actually shipped from the same physical facility. The shipper may be shipping product for multiple companies or multiple product categories. In this scenario, the shipper is recording transportation cost uh, to the company or product line associated with the revenue earned from selling the product. Shippers exporting product outside of their country have to adhere to export rules and regulations. Additional paperwork and filing is required for exports. A commercial invoice document is required for exporting all types of products. And this document is used for import control, valuation, and also for determining duties. To comply with the compliance requirements, exporters must de determine their harmonized tariff codes for each product they export. Um, and the harmonized tariff code is ultimately a 10-digit classification code uh, that's used on a global scale. Uh, the shipper is responsible for looking up their harmonized tariff codes and maintaining those codes in their systems. For U.S. shippers exporting to Canada and Mexico, a NAFTA certificate of origin is required. When shipping outside of the NAFTA trade zone, a standard certificate of origin is also required. Um, the certificate of origin is a document that ultimately just declares the actual origin of products, the value um, that are being exported or imported into a country. The rules and regulations do vary by product and country, so ultimately it's up to the shipper uh, to, to really understand when this document is required for exporting. The same is true for filing with AES Direct. AES is the U.S. Bureau of Customs and Border Protection's automated export system. This system collects and retains electronic shippers export declaration or the SED records. Uh, prior to AES, exporters, exporters had to produce the SED document. However, the AES moved all the filing to an electronic system. Uh, the, the ultimate deliverable is the ITN number or the internal transaction number. Uh, and this is really just a confirmation that the export information has been successfully received by the Census Bureau. For exports from Canada, uh, there are similar customs requirements, including the, uh, the Certificate of Origin, the NAFTA, and the Standard Document, uh, and also the Export Declaration for Select Goods.